What's up guys, Chris Lado. Today I'm gonna to run through the actual IG complaint from Lou Elizondo. It's amazing, I learned a ton from it. He makes some wild claims, he can back them up with evidence, and it really, it filled in a lot of pieces for me and gave some ideas for where some new future videos are. So let's get right to it. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Okay, here's the actual complaint. Fraud, waste, and abuse DOD hotline. There it is. This is to the IG. So this is uh, page one. Lou Elizondo says, I choose to identify myself for the complaint and I give permission for DOD hotline to release my identity on a need to know basis. Okay, this is it, hand filled out, I love it. There it is, Luis Daniel Elizondo, other Department of Defense. So next page is his information. Yes, I'm willing to be interviewed. And now allegation details. So he goes here now to really part two. Allegation details. Identify the person who committed the alleged wrongdoing. Gary Reed. He's the commander of USDI or the director of it at the time. Retiree and civilian employee. Next on the list is Susan Goff. She was public affairs officer for the Pentagon. Military reserves. She was actually a psyops officer from the army, civilian employee. That's probably not the person you want leading your public affairs. I, don't know. I guess it depends what point you come from. And then he, finally is Neil Tipton. Neil Tipton was his supervisor, Lou's supervisor, when he was working on the ATIP program at USTI. Spelled incorrectly. Okay, one thing I do notice is uh, Lou has a tendency to misspell people's names, which I found <laughs> does tend to make people uh, upset, actually. So Neil actually spelled with two L's. Lakatsky spells Lakatsky's name actually incorrect um, through a lot of these. So uh, initially I thought that this kind of maybe detracted from it, but he makes those mistakes kind of consistently. It's kind of just a, a mistake that uh, Lou tends to make. I've seen, I've seen that before with really good fighter pilots, actually. Some amazing fighter pilots I knew were just terrible spellers. Literally just could not spell basic words. So uh, this actually kind of adds to the realism for me, but yeah, it's unfortunate. He spelled the names wrong. Um, so you'll see it here. Neil Tipton, the final guy he names. Now let's get to the actual allegations. What did the persons do or fail to do that was wrong? So let's look at this. Conducted retribution and provided false information to the public, abusing government authority, illegal destruction of information. I mean, those are pretty, pretty large claims. To 2018 to the present. When did the incident occur? 2018 to the present. This is kind of weird. When were you made aware of the problem is 2017. So if the problem started in 2017, uh, it's it really just didn't occur. The problems didn't occur until 2018. Where did they take place? At the Pentagon. Look at that. What rule, regulation, or law do you believe to have been violated? Lou says, Whistleblower Protection Act, multiple DOD directives, instructions, Freedom of Information Act. That Freedom of Information Act is an interesting one. We'll talk about that at the end. Briefly summarize how you believe our office can assist you regarding your matter. Inspector General should conduct a comprehensive review, inquiry, investigation into abuse of power, lying to the public, destruction of evidence, and conspiracy. Man, look at that. The Damn. Have you reported this matter to any other organizations, or agencies? No. And then he signs the certif certifications, okay? He signed these. This is a signed form by Lou Elizondo. Man, I consider him a man of honor. Look at this. I certify that all the statements made in this complaint are true, complete, and correct to the best of my knowledge. I understand that a false statement or concealment of a material fact is a criminal offense. Awesome. So he signed that. Let's see what he, what he alleges, okay? So for this, I actually added my own highlights. I added my own highlights to a lot of these just to make it uh, easier to read. Go ahead, feel free to pause and read through. I think it's a great product just to read, document, to read the whole thing. I learned a ton. But for this, I'll just go through the highlighted portions, okay? Because that's what really stood out for me. So this is the letter from Lou Elizondo when he filed this, actually 3 May 2021, so just last year, to the Inspector General. The Inspector General is supposed to be an outside agency, okay, in the military that actually looks at claims so they can answer claims, abuse of power. This is exactly what they're supposed to be there for, is to be a impartial 
right? Impartial entity that can actually do investigative issues, right? To answer people's claims, abuse of power, exactly. This is what it is for, okay? So he writes, Inspector General, Investigative Personnel, Attention. My name is Louis D. Elizondo. The purpose of this letter is to request an official U.S. Department of Defense Inspector General Inquiry Investigation into malicious activities, coordinated disinformation, professional misconduct, whistleblower reprisal, and explicit threats perpetrated by certain senior level Pentagon officials, including the Director of Defense Intelligence for Intelligence and Security, Gary Reed, Public Affairs Officer, Susan Goff, and any other officials who are complicit in these acts. Looks like Neil Tipton was on there. These negative actions against me have resulted in great personal and professional challenges to me and my family. He mentions that a few times in this, man. Lou has definitely come under a lot of strain, and you can tell, you know, he's basically at his, at his wit's end, kind of a man in desperation. Furthermore, evidence exists that substantiates my claim that there may be a deeper conspiracy within the OSD staff to circumvent DOD policy, rules, and regulations, and perhaps even law. That is amazing. That's his conspiracy claim is why aren't we getting information? Why haven't we gotten any videos actually released? I think this will highlight kind of how broken the process is. As reprisals continue to be levied towards me, I respectfully request DOD IG conduct a comprehensive review of all related activities against me over the last three years and correct the record of my involvement in the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Sincerest regards, signed Louis D. Elizondo, stands for Daniel. All right, so pretty interesting. Let's go through the actual, this next section will go through the chronology of what really happened, okay? It, it highlighted a lot of things for me. First, June 2008. While assigned as a chief to the Information Sharing and Forward Intelligence Relationships Office, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, I was approached by representatives from the Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program to provide CI, as counterintelligence and security expertise to their office. So this is June 2008, basically Jay Stratton and two other people that are redacted here contacted Lou Elizondo and said, hey, can you do counterintelligence for us? Can you run our program essentially? And they said OSAP, okay? So that came from OSAP, June 2008. Then July 2008, so the next month, after several personal meetings in my office, Mr. Stratton and a redacted person invited me to meet with the OSAP director, Dr. James Lekatsky. Okay, James Lekatsky, you'll see his name come up in the recent book written, uh, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. The whole time, Lou uh, misspells Lekatsky, right? It should be, uh, from what I understand, L-A-C-A-T-S-K-Y. Um, but he puts in two Ks, does it all the time, also misspells Neil's name. So I, I consider it just, it's something, it's like a, mis, you know, a, a character flop, you will. He has trouble spelling names or doesn't uh, appreciate it. Jim, and really, because he called him Jim after that, okay? And Lekatsky is kind of an interesting name. So he calls Dr. Lekatsky Jim. Dr. Lekatsky introduced himself as an expert in missile technology and as the director for the OSAP program. He further explained that OSAP was part of a very sensitive effort that was sponsored by very senior level individuals at both the legislative and executive branches. Jim, Dr. Lekatsky, asked me what I think about UFOs. My response was sincere in that I don't think about UFOs. So he just hadn't really even thought about it up to that point. That same month, after one addition follow on meeting with Dr. Lekatsky at his office in Rosslyn, I was officially asked by Dr. Lekatsky to assume the role of OSAP's chief of counterintelligence and security. Okay, so that was in July 2008. He had already received approval by the program sponsors, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, Senator Ted Stevens, and Senator Daniel Inouye. And this is actually documented. Uh, he has it in later, later documents. Okay, next month, August 2008, while supporting the OSAP effort, I was informed by Dr. Lukatsky and other OSAP personnel about a specific portfolio known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, and that most of my efforts will be focused on that aspect of the project. So this is where he talks about ATIP, okay? It's just one particular portfolio inside the OSAP whole program. I was informed this effort involved collecting data and evidence from military personnel who came into contact with UAPs. So I think that's why he, he seemed involved with it, helping personnel. I was asked to develop a comprehensive counterintelligence and security plan for this effort to protect the program from possible foreign intelligence service penetrations, okay? So they're basically worried about this program getting spied on from foreign agencies. Okay, so they hire Lou Elizondo. In September to June 2009, so basically the next year, 
Lou Elizondo creates a counterintelligence and security posture, right? Ample correspondence exists between DIA senior staff and Dr. Lukatsky that substantiates DIA leadership was not only supportive, but also in favor of the OSAP ATIP efforts to be expanded. So over the following year, basically Elizondo says he works on it. He created the counterintelligence security posture and it sounds like he got more and more involved in ATIP. Those emails still exist within a specific office at the Pentagon in both electronic and hard copies. Okay, so all the documentation he, Lou Elizondo says exists in the Pentagon saying that DIA supported this program. They supported OSAP, they supported ATIP, and the efforts were to be expanded. Okay, okay this changed basically in July 2009 to January 2010. So basically the fall of 2009, this changed. New leadership at DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, began to create challenges for Dr. Lukatsky. So despite the previous leadership fully endorsing the efforts, someone was the headquarter, lead, public affairs, not sure, of DIA, and began attempts to shut down the effort. As was explained to me by colleagues, there was a religious aversion to the subject matter by certain members of DIA and the OSD staff. So this is where we've heard before that some members of staff, or who knows, DIA basically had a religious aversion saying it was angels and demons and to shut the program down. That's really what he, Lou says here, that's why they shut the program down. It was my observation that key elements, this is in May 2010 to August 2012 now, it was my observation that key elements within Defense Intelligence Agency were attempting to hide anything related to OSEP simply due to a perceived sense of stigma. As such, I focused our remaining efforts on ATIP, given that there was ample information, data, and evidence, which we continue to receive, that indicated continued incursions into controlled U.S. airspace, both CONUS and OCONUS. So we haven't heard this about OCONUS incursions, okay? We've only heard about CONUS, which is really uh, around the contiguous U.S. OCONUS is overseas, okay? So this is the first mention I've seen, at least, of OCONUS. During this time period, my office had multiple meetings with eyewitnesses to include pilots, radar operators, and ship's crew. There are numerous emails from senior military service members and leadership that substantiate the fact that the threat was real. The emails still exist within the OUSDNI. Okay, so Lou continues to have multiple emails. You can get more information about this saying that, hey, the threat is real. They have military personnel, leadership, both in the US and overseas saying that, hey, there, we have incursions. September 2012, as initial funding was exhausted for the ATIP program, right, so they basically removed funding, we successfully secured an additional $10 million through Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. This funding was, was to be used for fiscal years 13 and 14. However, another office within the organization managed by Redacted used the funding to support academic studies involving intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So in academic studies for ISR, they stole the money. All right, October 2013. So next year goes by, I inform my supervisor, Mr. Neil Tipton, again misspelled, okay, Neil has two L's, of my work in a parallel portfolio. Mr. Tipton indicated he had no issue with me working other efforts as long as my duties were not neglected at the Intelligence Sharing and Partner Engagement Office. Okay, so basically Lou Elizondo has separate duties. You do get additional duties in the military, okay, so you can be working on different portfolios, especially when it sounds like it's all super secret classified. Okay, there is mention later to turn this into a SAP, SCIF. You're talking very, very high classifications, very high need to know. A lot of these people like Mr. Tipton probably wasn't read into the, to the program or wasn't allowed to it. So you do have this separated stuff. Mr. Tipton indicated he had no issue with me working other efforts as long as my duties were not neglected. So Mr. Tipton is like, okay, I understand this. Go ahead. Early 2014, my office received a very compelling video in 2011, sent to us on JWICS that was collected by a sensitive US platform operating in a denied area. So JWICS is the super, super high classified uh, network. Okay, it's higher than SIPR, difficult to access, difficult to use, has to be only in certain secret areas. So that means it was in a denied area. So I'm guessing overseas in some area that, so in this way, this could be a sensitive video, obviously, all right, for many reasons. But exciting because the video was approximately 18 to 20 minutes in duration and appeared to show three UAPs flying in a distinct triangle formation. So very interesting. The first time I've heard about this video. So overseas, you're talking about a denied area. What a denied area. What does that mean? Probably not our airspace. 
and 18 to 20 minutes long, three UAPs flying in a distinct triangle formation. So we've seen that on other videos as well. Why can't we get this one released? It would be my first question. Mr. Tipton's response to me was that the video was weird and compelling and that he had no idea what the object was. Details and specifics can be provided. <laughs> awesome. I love Lou just has all this other data uh, sitting in the background. All right, 2015 now. So next year, Lou says, I briefed the ATIP portfolio to blank. Okay, we don't know who this was. Who was at the time a senior executive U.S. Air Force detailee to OUSDI. This is interesting to me because he mentions the Air Force here. At the time, his staff and mine shared office space at blank and he was instrumental in providing me advice and assistance. My hope was to use this person, I'm guessing, as an interlocutor with U.S. Air Force in order to understand the UAP issue from an Air Force perspective. So he's trying to get some access from the Air, Air Force. What are they thinking? Up until this point, I'm guessing he has no real access from the Air Force except for this one dude. Okay, so that was interesting to me. Uh, also interesting, this photo was later shown to Mr. Brendan McKernan, the current UAP Task Force Director, by, I'm guessing that guy, as evidence that he was aware of and supports uh, the program, ATIP. All right, moving now, so he kind of summarizes 2014, 2016. My office was routinely engaged with other members of the intelligence community in a formal working group, specifically organized for the purposes of discussing and assessing UAP activity. So they're basically integrating okay, his office with other elements of the IC community in a final working group. In one such instance, a senior member of the U.S. Navy sent an email pleading for guidance as to what he or she should do if they encounter more UAPs. This documentation still exists. So this is where he interviews 2004. They started looking into that. So what Lou is saying here is they're getting more UAP evidence. Okay, They're getting more incursions, more indications that this is going on, not less. It's not like the problem is going away. It's actually getting worse. 2015 to 2017 now. On a regular basis, Mr. Stratton, again, the original guy, who was assigned at the time as Stratcon liaison officer and Mr. Brennan McKernan, current UAP task force director, and I, would discuss new reports that were received and engage in a larger working group discussion with other elements within the IC. These meetings were conducted in designated areas, special areas, right, skiffs, like I mentioned, within the Pentagon or Sweetland Naval Air Station. Expertise ranging from electro-optical experts to radar engineers would be utilized to try and ascertain some of the observations and what models of physics would be required to explain UAP performance. This is quite interesting to me coming up. Okay, so they're investigating everything. In 2016, a formal O plan, so this is an operational plan, was drafted and submitted through alternative compensatory control measure channels. I don't know what that is. The O plan was significant in detail, including the frequency of incursions by UAP locations and type. At one point, a comprehensive listing of UAP activity was included for the entire month. So this is off. This also is very good information. Okay, there was a formal O plan was drafted and submitted. An O plan is an operational plan for how we can actually do something to affect this. Okay, it's a large strategic plan okay that you're going to actually execute yeah interesting why did they look at this okay the uap task force uh my direct supervisor okay i'm guessing this is i'm guessing it was neil tipton but i'm not 100 percent sure was later asked to provide information on a 2013 fbi investigation called blank for which the sworn statements would be useful for our efforts the investigation involved potential uap activity near a sensitive U.S. government facility. Also, another interesting point to me is there's an FBI investigation going on from 2013. Where, what is this sensitive U.S. government facility? Is it a nuclear facility? Would be my question. It was during this time I grew increasingly frustrated by the lack of resources and interest by senior leadership. UAP reporting to our office was increasing, yet our resources were minimal, and leadership involvement was almost non-existent. In 2016, we su succeeded and having an unclassified academic study performed by a local university in Washington, D.C. regarding signatures of space threats and capabilities, including intercontinental ballistic missiles. So again, they're just desperate. So that's what it sounds like. No one will listen to them. They keep saying, hey, we're getting more stuff, we're getting more stuff, we're getting more indications. Nothing, right? Until some, something crashes or blows up, they don't do anything. Late 2016, after increased frustration, I became alarmed by the frequency and duration of UAP activity in and around controlled airspace. The instance, instances seemed more provocative, and during one instance, they came within feet of U.S. fighter aircraft. This, the video of this encounter still exists on the ATIP share drive, known as Y Project, within the JWIC share drive. Okay, so it's, unfortunately, it's on the highly, highly classified JWIC server, okay? I don't know how if it's even possible to get stuff off of that, but it's there, right? This video exists. 
Okay, more product, more provocative, and it's within feet of fighter aircraft. So have, has the UAP task force looked at this video? Be my other question, my next question. However, prior to informing Mr. Gary Reed, I was warned by several individuals that Mr. Gary Reed could not be trusted. Unusual relationship with his subordinate. At the time, a third party allegation of sexual harassment was reported to me involving Mr. Gary Reed by one of my office subordinates. Okay, so basically, Lou says here is, he was wanted to bring it up. He's increasingly frustrated. He wants to go direct to the leader, to the commander of the whole organization, right? Gary Reed is running the whole organization at that point, but he did not trust him. He could not trust him either because he has his own issues. People he ta that he's talking with say that Gary Reed's not gonna support him on this. Could he have maybe presented it to him? Possibly, but it sounds like he doesn't think it would even be possible. So he didn't. 2016, 2017 now. During this time period, my colleagues within ATIP and I grew increasingly frustrated with a lack of senior level awareness and apathy towards the ATIP. So they just didn't care. Initially, the idea was to include members of the defense industrial base and other experts to have access to unclassified UAP videos to help determine and assess performance and design characteristics. In 2017, I executed a DOD form 1910 and submitted through the defense office a pre-publication and security review for a security review of three videos, Fleer, Go Fast, and Gimbal. Okay, so this is where Lou highlights that he filled out this form in 1910, form 1910 to get it unclassified, right? To get these videos released because no one will listen. Okay, it's been several years, no one will listen. He can't get anyone in his organization to listen, can't get other people outside the organization to listen. Finally, he's like, look, these are probably the most unclassified. There's nothing on here that can give away our systems. Let's release these. So he does say here, although I wanted to limit the distribution of the three unclassified videos to only certain parties, WHS indicated to me it was easier for them to simply authorize unlimited distribution. A few days later, my request via the 1910 was officially stamped by DOPSR for unrestricted dissemination. Okay, so he gets it. He gets these videos released. That was Lou Elizondo right here filling out this form 1910. Okay, so we should fill out more of those. I was invited by several direct reports to Secretary of Defense Jane Mattis to provide an official ATIP briefing within the SecDef Suite E-Ring River Entrance Pentagon. Okay, so now that it's released, now the videos get out, all of a sudden they want to talk to him, right? Now they want to talk to him. Up until then, we can't listen to our people, right? We couldn't possibly. <laughs> if it's not coming out of the leadership of that organization, why would we listen? Okay, because the leadership in that organization doesn't want this information to come out. They don't agree with it. They don't care about it. So. This person, SES, Senior Representative to the Secretary of Defense, my initial meeting with was a result of a direct request by the staff at the SecDef's front office. So now Lou Elzon is going to the Secretary of Defense's office. This is in 2017. He's like, I'll be able to actually brief this now to the SecDef, right? Maybe James Mattis will actually hear, hear me brief this. During the meeting, I expressed my frustration of a lack of senior level visibility and excessive stove piping within the department. They were sympathetic. Then to the Secretary of Defense, I received several telephone calls on my personal cell phone from requesting a briefing on ATIP. My meetings were arranged by SecDef front office personnel. There's calendar invites. It took place in the Secretary's suite. During the initial briefing with blank, ATIP data and findings were shared. This meeting lasted for over 60 minutes. At the conclusion of the meeting, a follow-on meeting was requested. Okay, you normally don't request a follow-on meeting if you're not interested. During the second meeting, express consternation about how to inform the Secretary of ATIP findings, given that there is no permanent USDI in place and that the SecDev was relatively new, but they were sympathetic to our program's challenges. So this is just a first indication of the wussiness, right? So they, they couldn't inform the Secretary. They just couldn't tell him, right? They didn't know how. There was no permanent USDI in place. That means there's no permanent uh, US Director of the Intelligence in place right then, okay? So, how are they going to tell him? And the SecDev was relatively new, right? I mean, he's got a lot more stuff to worry about than this, than this stuff, right? After several meetings, asked me to arrange a briefing for several of the eyewitnesses from the 2004 USS Nimitz investigation, namely the F-18 pilots and the E-2 Hawkeye radar operator that were on station at the time. As a result of his request, I successfully brought in several pilots and the radar operator, along with Mr. McKernan, to provide a full description of the encounter. 
Blank, I'm guessing the person listening to the brief, was concerned due to his previous experience being an F-18 pilot himself. After the meeting, they asked for us to return and brief his colleague. Electronic voicemails are available to confirm meetings. In the SecDef suite, right? So he's going there, he briefed this guy. Interesting for me here was the actual E-2 Hawkeye radar operator. Interesting me, for me here is the actual E-2 Hawkeye radar operator was on station at the time. So that's interesting to me because the actual engagement was directed, at least Fravor was directed there by the Spy-1, that's with the shipborne. But the next engagement, where they actually got the FLIR-1 video, okay, that one was directed by E-2 Hawkeye. E-2 Hawkeye has additional radar capabilities. Okay, so that means, in my mind, this, e this Hawkeye radar operator was tracking it, basically cued them onto the actual object itself from the, from the F-18 radar, okay? So this Hawkeye radar operator, I think, was able to cue the fighter radar onto the object. So it means it was tracked as well. Also interesting. After several meetings, I was introduced to someone else who was the secretary's senior liaison to one of the members of the IC. After several weeks of briefing, she indicated to her colleagues and other government agencies are also working, taking this topic seriously, but did not know how to proceed at the time. This person indicated her concern about briefing the SecDef until they had a better understanding of the topic and the threat. Okay, so this is where we get into our issue, okay? The stigma, they don't wanna brief it up, they just can't figure out how to tell him. Oh, we just can't tell you the information that we're supposed to tell you because we don't know how, because we're scared, right? And because we don't have an understanding of the threat. By the way, you're not gonna have understanding of the threat because this is the unidentified area of phenomena, okay? The whole point of it, this whole thing is we don't understand it. We don't have an understanding of the threat, but that doesn't mean you hide the threat, right? You don't have an understanding of the threat, so you're not telling the leadership, but it doesn't mean you hide the threat. You just don't wanna highlight that you have no understanding of it. You don't wanna highlight your inadequacies, right? And then you're gonna put him in a bad position because what's he gonna say now? What is, what is the, you know, the SecDef gonna say? What's he gonna do? I don't know, but maybe he's the guy that should be making the decisions, right? The person that we put in that chair, not you because we didn't put you in that chair. You didn't get in that chair. You got in that chair through some finagling of things and how you were able to scratch your way to the top. That's how you got in the chair. Maybe you should just let the deciders make the decisions instead of you. Mr. Tippin agreed to assume the management role of ATIP under the condition that I remain an advisor and part of the ATIP construct. So this is July to 3 October 2017. So basically, Lou has basically had it at this point, from what I can tell, as he said, it's not gonna work. They are just not gonna pass it the information, right? He even says it right here. I explained to, the, to this person that time was not on our side. Action must be taken to inform the secretary. I informed them of my previous interaction with the secretary when he was the Marine Expeditionary Unit Commander in Kandahar, Afghanistan. And my experience with the secretary is that he would prefer to be informed sooner rather than later, i.e. Just give him the information. So at this point, I think Lou is just fed up with it. He ends up transferring, okay, he transfers control or direction of ATIP to Mr. Tipton. Okay, so Mr. Tipton agreed to assume the management role of ATIP under, under the condition that I remain an advisor and part of the ATIP construct. So he asked, hey, you gotta help me with this, okay? I'm not gonna do it on my own because I don't know really anything about it, which is kind of what I get from his emails. Per guidance from blank and blank, I drafted an official memorandum assigning my ATIP responsibilities to Mr. Tipton for SecDef approval and signature. Mr. Tipton received the memorandum and voiced his approval. Sounds good, attachment five and six. Man, those documents suck, right? When they bring up those documents from the past that you signed. After nearly a decade of working within the ATIP portfolio, I decided to resign my position within the Pentagon and submit my resignation letter. I deliberately addressed my resignation letter to the secretary himself knowing my senior supervisor, Mr. Gary Reed, would not be able to hide it from him. Exactly. So that is the first part. That's really what Lou did, the actions up to that point, why he resigned, how the videos came out. All very enlightening stuff. I really enjoyed it. Now we'll go through just quickly, just two minutes. Now we'll just go through quickly on what are the issues, okay, what the rest of it. So 5 October, Mr. Gary Reed asked what, what to do with the letter. 
Lou told him he should do whatever he thinks is prudent, but the letter was intended for the Secretary of Defense. Mr. Reed was clearly upset with me and indicated that he wanted to see me in his office. He also said that he would tell people you are crazy and it might impact your security clearance. <laughs> awesome. Lou's like, hey, I'm a civilian, man. You don't owe me anymore. December 2017, on December... Both the New York Times and Politico broke a story about the ATIP program. In both these stories, Pentagon spokesperson Ms. Dana White validated the existence of the program and my role as lead. This is where the, just, the debacle just can, starts, right? So they say, December 2017, that he was in charge of ATIP, man. Oh, God. And then it just keeps changing. Then in March 2018, turns out Gary Reed is under a formal investigation for inappropriate relations. Surprise. Under a Freedom of Information Act request by a member of the media, it was revealed that an official U.S. AFOSI investigation was conducted regarding three unclassified videos that were authorized for release. In this investigation, there were no findings of me conducting any kind of unauthorized disclosure. Okay, so this is really where they just start coming after Lou Elizondo. And you can see here, the first is they open an Air Force, OS, an Air Force OSI investigation. Just seems like, why the, why the Air Force OSI? Uh, regarding three classified videos, right? Because this is not, it's Navy videos. So I'm curious why they would do that. He actually attaches in here is how nothing was found wrong. Let's look at that right now. What's great here is Lou talks through the actual videos. Okay, so this is the, the form, the document that he requested. This is this DD form 1910. Okay, we should be filling out more of these. And right here it says type MPG file, go fast gimbal FLIR, and so he says here, what's the subject area? UAV, balloons, and other UASs, okay? So he doesn't say UAP on there. And maybe that you know, makes people mad or something. But from him, uh, publication data, not applicable, not for publication, research and analysis only, and info sharing with other US government and industry peers for the purposes of developing a database to help identify, analyze, and ultimately defeat UAS threats. The attached material has department Approval for public release and clearance for open publication is recommended under provisions of DOD, right? It's clear for release. Okay, I just want everyone to remember that we pay taxes so that the military, the government can defend the nation, right? But all of the stuff that they get, all of the stuff that they're using, everything that a government official records is owned by us, okay, because we own the government. I just want everyone to remember this. So when they say there's nothing classified in these videos, and they go and look at it, and the video was even originally unclassified, that means they're fucking unclassified, man. They're released. Why? Because we deserve to know the information, right? That's what he did. You know how hard it is to get stuff unclassified? It's very, very hard because no one's willing to go and just say, it's unclassified. But you know what was on those tapes? Nothing classified, man. There's nothing classified on those videos. I've looked through them like hundreds of times. There's nothing. There's nothing more classified than showing those videos than showing all the videos of buildings blowing up, bombs we've dropped in combat, any of that stuff. Okay, the only reason they don't want to, they don't want to release it, and then just show it. Here, it's so clear. So this is the original one, right? I read through all these emails basically saying, hey, how do we release it? How do we get it released? He goes through and lists all the email exchange. Okay, there's, I'd say it's all looks legit. He spells Neil wrong. Okay, a couple things there. Maybe that's why they don't approve it. All right, because he spelled his name wrong. He's got, this is the, uh, AFOSI investigative communication, so Air Force OSI. Okay, so this is the, I think what uh, Gary Reed filed, it's, it sounds like Gary Reed filed this to come after Lou Elizondo, to attack him basically for saying that he shouldn't have released these videos, right? Because they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't pass up the information, they wouldn't devote any time, effort, money to this, and they wouldn't even let Lou Elizondo brief up the chain of command. Okay, so basically they thought it was it was BS for whatever reason, religious, or didn't want to deal with it. So here it is. This is their claim. So unauthorized disclosure of potentially classified DOD videos. Okay, this is, this is the claim, right? Remember, these are unclassified. 
Let's look at it. This investigation was initiated on 22 December, following the 16 December release of a video of two F-18 Hornets tracking an unidentified flying object to the New York Times news agency. The video in question named Gimbal was previously classified. It says secret, no foreign in there. And it was unknown if the proper deep classification authorization was gained prior to release of the video. Okay, was it classified secret, no foreign? Okay, so I highlighted here. On 12 March 18, DET 334 conducted an interview, basically an investigation, Explain the videos did not go through the proper channels to obtain their declassification, although the videos are unclassified for official use only. Just want to highlight there, right? It says right there, unclassified, F-O-U-O. -O. What does that mean? It's unclassified. We don't share it around. It's controlled information, okay? But it's going to be pretty hard to say that we can't release that to the public. Stated the videos will not undergo the formal declassification process just because they were inadvertently released to the public. Okay, so this guy, this person who who reviews all information. Listen, to, this is how, look, this is a glimpse into our security release apparatus. Blank, redacted, relayed. There was no indication the videos were classified in the first place. Blank, blank, stated 100% of all F-18 videos go through his office for declassification and public release. That person also stated the videos which subject released never went through his office. So, question is, how do you even know it's an F-18 video? Okay, because that is a tarting pod video. Doesn't, I mean, F-18 video. The other thing is 100% of all F-18 videos go through this one guy. Think about that. So if you're ever wondering, why don't we get information? Why aren't videos being released? Why have we had no new videos released since the, the one crappy hearing video they released in the past year, right? Think about that. Nothing has been released. It's because all of them go through this one guy, right? And this one guy says, nah, or this one guy gets a call from Susan Goff saying, hey, don't release that because I'm trying to change the FOIA. <laughs> um, you know, we don't want to release that. Guess what's going to happen? It's not going to be released. He's just going to say no. And how many, how many of these guys do you think exist up the chain? A lot, okay? And either way, unclassified in the first place. These videos were not even classified in the first place. Remember that. And you look at it, they're not, okay? You can find videos of buildings blowing up just like it, using the same exact pod on the internet, and that's just fine, right? Nobody's filing uh, complaints over that. All right, finally, on, April, on 13 April 2018, blank redacted, contacted someone, redacted, and confirmed that after conducting an official classification review, the three videos obtained by subject were confirmed to be unclassified. Blank stated the unauthorized disclosure program management office considered the matter closed. Conclusion. Air Force OSI DET-334 considers this matter closed and will forward the appropriate documentation to the Undersecretary of Defense, Intelligence, Pentagon, Washington, D.C. for action. Okay, that was in 2018. Question is, three years later, Lou is still dealing with it, right? He's still dealing with it, even though it was proven the videos are unclassified, there's nothing on there, the release was being limited by who? Hmm, I wonder... And, how, and why they kept saying he wasn't a part of the ATIP program. This is the public affairs office standing from the Pentagon, okay? It's just ridiculous to me, okay? There's issues of him. 2009, here we go. Harry Reid names him by name, okay? Says ATIP is a program. Here it is, attachment one. <laughs> Look at this. Okay, he's number 10. What's also interesting is this list, okay? So this is the list. This is from Harry Reid, this letter basically asking for a, a SAP. This is a, a special access program office. So in order to get higher security, so that they can get more information about higher security programs. I think they think some of these are our programs, okay? So who's starting this? Basically is the fiscal year 10 preliminary bigoted list of government personnel. So we have William and Lynn is the deputy secretary of defense. Okay, so there someone was, was involved. Senator Harry Reid of Nevada, Daniel Inouye of, of Hawaii, Robert Herbert of U.S. Senate. There's Dr. James Lukatsky, okay, Jay Stratton, and then Special Agent Lou Elizondo. There's also four other people that we don't see in here. Another interesting thing is the contractors. Who are the, actually the contractors here? Is the same names again, man. You keep seeing the same names all again. Robert Bigelow for OSAP. Colm Kelleher from, from uh Bass, he's also a contractor, and then Hal Putoff is also a contractor. Okay, so for me, just seeing the same names over and over, 
for me, just seeing the same names over and over again kind of flags a red flag in my brain, okay? Because this information is all going back to these small channels and we still have the same people again and again. So that's kind of interesting to me. This shows again that this is the SAP request when they made the SAP request in 2017. That was the clearance of that. And then this is the uh, emails on basically all the personal email information. But I have with Neil Tipton, again, he just, again, no one corrects him either. Like I would correct someone, hey, hey man, spelled two L's. And this is his resignation letter. Okay, Let, letter of resignation, deferred retirement, deferred retirement. And really it's because he can get no one to listen to him. With that in mind, bureaucratic challenges and inflexible mindsets continue to plague the department at all levels. How hard is it, people? Stop thinking about your careers. Think more about just doing the right thing. Finally, the scathing review of Ms. Goff. Okay, this is a letter sent from Lou Elizondo. This was in uh, 21. Okay, so he's basically, he's like, why do you keep saying this? You keep saying no assigned duties in the ATIP program but everyone knows I was involved in the, I ran it. Like I'm on so many letters. How can you keep saying this? Another interesting, again, Eric Davis. Okay, so I think he's probably one of those names we're missing that are redacted up there. He was a senior scientist for ATIP. Okay, Eric Davis, again, coming up, right? He's in the Wilson memo. So these names, the same names keep coming up, which again is a red flag kind of in my, in my brain. Lekatsky again, <laughs> spelled incorrect. Sorry, man. Uh, with this information at hand, I cannot imagine any reason you cannot readily clarify the facts and correct the record, but they don't, right? They don't. Although I'm confident that via the FOIA process or through congressional press inquiries that the truth will eventually come to light, my hope is you see this issue revolve, resolve sooner rather than later, having paid a deep personal, emotional, and professional price for your mistakes and inaction of last year. I confess, I share feelings and frustration. I hope you'll reach out to those above and do so promptly so this matter can be put to rest. What do you think? You guys think it's going to happen? Okay, what do you think? Let's see how they reacted. Okay, well, this is back in 2019 from Susan Goff. Look at this, though. One other thing you need to do is reach out to the Air Force's FOIA office. We need to keep a very, very close eye on FOIA requests for release of UAP videos to ensure consistency of what does, doesn't get released. Generally, so far, at least with Navy vids, we're not releasing them. Regards, Sue. Okay, so they're not gonna release it. Do you wonder where information gets stopped? This is it, it gets stopped at all of these levels. No one wants to say it's released. I mean, look, she's saying we're gonna affect the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. We're gonna affect the Freedom of Information Act office, right? To say that they're not gonna release these. We need to watch these people very, very close. We need to watch you very, very close. This is from Chinfo, Washington, final thing here. This is a captain, strategic engagements. Watch what he says here. Jeff, thanks for reaching out. Megan is correct. From a public affairs perspective, all media inquiries on UAPs go to DOD Public Affairs. Sue Goff, keeping me in the loop as we coordinate closely. To date, we have not authorized any media interviews on the subject. Make no comment. The nuances of all this are such that any deviations from the statements that DOD makes result in multiple news stories and additional FOIA, FOIA requests at various levels, right? All those FOIA requests, man, when you have to release the information that you're doing based on taxpayer funding that we gave you and doing the mission that we assigned to you from the taxpayers, that information that you have to give back to us because it's a fucking Freedom of Information Act request written into the Constitution, government, I don't know if it's written in the Constitution, should be. That's it, right? This is it. Make no comment. Why? Because there's too many nuances. Too many nuances. Really? How about you just brief the information to the leaders? How about you just give the information to the public? Have you heard of this? Is it too much public affairs issue for you? Too many military psychological operations getting in the way? How about you pass the information up that needs to get to the leaders and pass the information down that needs to get to the public? It's not rocket science. Integrity. Also, generally speaking, we let the normal FOIA process work as it is supposed to. But 
We have been requesting that FOIA offices coordinate with us on UAP-focused FOIA responses before they hit reply, so that new terms, language, etc. aren't introduced that complicate the overall messaging efforts. Additionally, there is now a security classification guidance document at the secret level that addresses the UAP issue and what may may not be discussed publicly. Great. Well, where are any documents? We're happy to see any videos, happy to release any information. All right, so maybe you guys should stop interfering in the FOIA process. Think, ever think of that? Maybe you guys should just do your jobs to pass up information that is critical in nature. Maybe you should stop having unprofessional relationships and attacking your whistleblowers. Maybe your people are whistleblowing for a reason. Maybe because the truth is being obfuscated. <laughs> Maybe because people aren't doing their jobs. It takes many years. Okay? Lou Elizondo has done an amazing, amazing gift here, really. Obviously, he's put on himself under a lot of pressure, a lot of undue public, public notice, a lot of people looking at him. Okay? So thanks to Lou Elizondo. Thanks for releasing this, man. Awesome stuff. I think it's very high. It highlights exactly the problems. Okay, it's our security classification or declassification issues. A lot of people sticking their little hands in the process they shouldn't. A lot of people abusing power. <laughs> Same old stuff, everybody. And this is why I just don't have a lot of faith in the government releasing their information. I just don't think they have a vested interest in it. They're not interested in transparency from what I've seen, and they're gonna to continue to lie and keep this separate. My question is, where are the videos? Okay, I'll believe it when I see any, any new video, compelling video. All right, guys, that's why we started our own UAP Society. Come to our Discord, support us there, join. If you wanna hang out, hit that like and subscribe button if you did like this video. Really helps the algorithm, really helps the channel. And please support, if you wanna support the channel, on patreon.com forward slash Chris Lado. Patrons get backstage access, including additional live streams, patron-only live streams, and additional information. I always appreciate the support. It lets me to do this full-time. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. Peace.